In Doctrine and Covenants, section 95, verse 8, the Lord says that one of his purposes for temples is to endow those whom I have chosen with power from on high. Receiving your endowment is a wonderful opportunity to come closer to Jesus Christ and receive power from him and our Heavenly Father. As I've talked with many young adults who are preparing to receive their endowment, I found that some of them are nervous because they don't know what to expect during the endowment, perhaps causing them to feel uncomfortable. Others have heard misinformation about aspects of the endowment. This video is specifically designed for those who are preparing to receive their temple endowment. I'd like to walk you through what will happen when you receive your endowment from the moment you enter the temple until the time you leave. In doing so, I'm trying to be careful to only say things that are appropriate to share and at the same time really help you know what to expect. The word endowment means a gift. In simple terms, you can think of the temple endowment as a gift from God where he gives you blessings and power. Ultimately, the gift Heavenly Father offers you is eternal life with him in the celestial kingdom. In the temple, you learn more about God's plan and make covenants that make it possible to return to God's presence. Incidentally, sometimes you hear people say something like, I'm going to take out my endowments. I'm not sure where that phrase came from, but you don't take out a gift. You receive it. That's why throughout this video, I'll refer to receiving your endowment. Now, before you go to the temple to receive your own endowment, you'll want to do a few things. First, your recommend for a living ordinance and your temple recommend need to be signed by both your bishop and your stake president. Second, make sure you schedule an appointment with the temple. Although you normally don't need appointments when you attend the temple, you do need an appointment when you receive your own endowment. Third, once you have your recommend, Make sure you've purchased the temple garment and either purchased temple clothing or made arrangements with the temple to rent such clothing. Finally, someone who has already been endowed will be going through the temple with you. They'll be your helper, often referred to as an escort. Usually this is a close family member or friend, and you'll want to choose who that person will be and invite them to attend the temple with you. Okay, let's dive in. When you arrive at the temple, you'll first show your temple recommend at the recommend desk. The men then go to the men's changing area, and the women go to the women's changing area. You'll have a private changing stall and a locker to store your clothing, similar to a temple baptistry. While you're in the stall, you'll change out of your street clothes, and you'll put on the temple garment for the first time. Then you'll dress in white clothes. If you're a woman, you'll wear something like a slip, a white temple dress, white slippers, and stockings. If you're a man, you'll wear white pants, a white shirt, white tie, and white socks and slippers, so you're all in white. Among other things, being dressed in white reminds us that through Jesus Christ, even though our sins are as scarlet, they can become as white as snow. The fact that all are dressed in white is also a beautiful symbol of unity and harmony, reminding us that we are all equal before God. In addition to dressing in white, both men and women will have a packet of ceremonial temple clothing. You won't put this clothing on yet, but you'll use it later as part of the endowment ordinance. Once you've changed, your escort will likely be waiting for you. He or she, it will be a person of your same sex, will also be dressed in white and will wait while you receive the initiatory ordinances. You might have heard people talk about doing initiatories at the temple. When people say this, they're referring to the initiatory ordinances, which are the first part of the endowment ceremonies. Initiatory means a beginning and is not only the first and preparatory ordinance, but it also signifies your initiation to one day become a priest or priestess to God. You will be symbolically washed, anointed, and authorized to wear the temple garment. The initiatory ordinances are relatively brief. They take about five to ten minutes. In the Old Testament, we read of something like these ordinances being done anciently in preparation for service in the priesthood. Exodus chapter 40, verses 12 and 13 says, Thou shalt bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and wash them with water. And thou shalt put upon Aaron the holy garments, and anoint him, and sanctify him. The initiatory ordinances happen just adjacent to the changing area, so the initiatory ordinance workers will be the same sex as you are. You may have heard church leaders talk about women exercising priesthood power in the temple. The initiatory ordinance is a great example of that. Your forehead will be symbolically washed, and a temple worker will give you a blessing. This blessing is similar to the sacrament prayers in that it's written down and uses the same words every time. And that's really nice because the blessing is beautiful. 
And you'll think to yourself, I want to remember every word of this blessing. But of course, you won't be able to remember everything, and that's okay. Just like you can do baptisms for the dead many times, you can also return to the temple and do initiatory work for the dead. That's what people mean when they say, I'm going to the temple to do initiatories. They mean they're doing initiatory work for those who have passed on. As you return to the temple to perform initiatory ordinances for the dead, you'll be able to again listen to the beautiful blessings that are promised. So after the washing, you'll be anointed. A temple worker will put a few drops of oil on your head and give you a blessing. Again, it's a set blessing similar to the washing blessing. Finally, you'll be authorized to wear the temple garment. You'll have already put it on in your private changing area, and this ordinance authorizes you to wear it. The garment is sometimes formally referred to as the garment of the holy priesthood. While we don't always need to use that full title, I think it's helpful to know that that's the name of the temple garment. Sometimes you hear people refer to the garment using slang words. If we talk about the garment in a casual way, it might lead us to treat or think about the garment in a casual way when the garment itself is actually sacred. As the church handbook explains, the temple garment is a reminder of covenants made in the temple and, when worn properly throughout life, will serve as a protection against temptation and evil. The garment should be worn beneath the outer clothing. It should not be removed for activities that can reasonably be done while wearing the garment, and it should not be modified to accommodate different styles of clothing. As we wear the garment of the holy priesthood, we're symbolically clothed in priesthood power. In addition to authorizing you to wear the temple garment and explaining the promises associated with it, the temple worker will give you a new name, which you will want to remember. The scriptures occasionally refer to a new name, but they don't give a lot of specifics as to what it is. Maybe I can first explain what your new name isn't. It's not your name from the premortal life. It's not a strange-sounding name in another language. It's a symbolic name. Remember that everything in the temple has symbolic meaning. We can think, perhaps, of many people who have made serious covenants to God and then received a new name. For example, Jacob had a powerful spiritual experience, and God changed his name to Israel. Or the Lamanites had a deep conversion and then took upon themselves a new name of anti nephi Lehi's. So perhaps, and I'm not saying this is the symbolism, but maybe a symbolism of receiving a new name at the temple is marking a momentous spiritual occasion in your life as you make covenants with God as part of the temple endowment. The prophet Joseph Smith taught that the new name is a key word. Put this idea next to President Brigham Young's definition of the temple endowment. He said, Your endowment is to receive all those ordinances in the house of the Lord which are necessary for you after you have departed this life, to enable you to walk back to the presence of the Father, passing the angels who stand as sentinels, being enabled to give them the key words, the signs, and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood. Thus, the new name is one of the key words that you'll use as you receive your temple endowment. You'll want to remember your new name throughout your life, but if by chance you forget it, either on the day you receive your endowment or in the future, a temple worker can remind you what it is. Now, everything we've talked about so far, the washing, anointing, clothing, receiving the new name, collectively, these are referred to as the initiatory ordinances. After you finish, you'll rejoin your escort. One of the temple leaders may come and chat with the two of you, or perhaps they might talk with you just before the initiatory ordinances. But either way, the temple leader might share some instructions or see if you have any questions. Then you'll go to the endowment room. Before continuing, I want to point out something that might be obvious, but maybe not to everyone. When you're baptized, all the focus is on you. You're the only person in the room being baptized. Receiving your endowment is different. All the people who go into the endowment room with you are either receiving their own endowment or they're receiving an endowment for somebody who is deceased, like being baptized for the dead. So you don't need to worry about being the center of attention during the endowment ceremony because all of the things I'm about to describe you doing, everybody else will be doing with you at the same time. Now, as we talk about the endowment room, every temple is a little different. In some temples, you stay in the same room throughout the entire endowment ceremony. In other temples, you move to different rooms at different stages of the endowment. This is a minor difference that isn't vital to the ordinance itself. In this video, I'll assume you're in one room throughout the endowment. As you enter the endowment room, men and women typically sit on opposite sides of the room, and you'll sit next to your escort. Towards the front of the endowment room is an altar. Remember that for millennia, 
altars have pointed to the death of Jesus Christ. For example, Abraham built an altar and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar. This was a similitude of God in his only begotten son. Moses also alluded to the altar as a symbol of Christ's death when he instructed Aaron to go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and make an atonement for thyself and for the people. Although we do not perform animal sacrifice in the temple today, we can remember that one symbol of the altar is Jesus Christ and his atonement. The altar at the temple is a subtle reminder of how central Jesus Christ is to the temple endowment. Now, the endowment ceremony takes about an hour and a half. Most of it is presented through a pre-recorded audiovisual presentation, which sometimes consists solely of narration and other times includes video. Note that some of the main characters in both the video and the audio narration are Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. As stated on the church's website, temples.churchofjesuschrist.org, during this video, the plan of salvation is presented, including the creation of the world, the fall of Adam and Eve, the atonement of Jesus Christ, and instruction on the way all people can return to the presence of the Lord. I like to think of this video as having basically three main parts. The first part is the creation of the world, when God and those who are assisting him creates the heavens, the earth, plants, animals, and eventually Adam and Eve, who are placed in the Garden of Eden. The second part of the video is what happens to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. You know the basic story. Satan tempts Adam and Eve, they partake of the forbidden fruit, and they try to hide their nakedness by making fig leaf aprons, which we can see as a symbol of their efforts to hide their sins from God. In the place of these aprons, the Lord made coats of skins for Adam and Eve. These coats of skins, represented by the temple garment, can be seen in the words of one author as a symbol of the true covering over of guilt, which Christ's atonement provides when we repent. The animal, which God presumably killed in order to make the coats of skin, could be read as a symbol of Christ. Thus, the temple garment itself is a constant reminder of Jesus Christ. This symbolic coat of skin not only covers our physical nakedness, but also reminds us that through Jesus Christ, our sins will be completely covered and atoned for as we repent and are faithful to our covenants. Really recognizing the garment as a representation of Christ's atonement can change the way we view it. One friend shared with me the joy he has as he puts on the temple garment, really feeling like Christ has him covered again. Well, the second part of the video ends with Adam and Eve having to leave the Garden of Eden. The third part of the video describes the efforts that Adam and Eve make to return to the presence of God. Throughout the endowment, you'll notice how Jesus Christ plays a central role in Adam and Eve's redemption, just as he does for us. One way we can symbolically view the endowment is it's like you and I are Adam and Eve. Think about the three parts of the video. You and I have been created. You and I have inherited the results of the fall. You and I are striving to return to the presence of God. Metaphorically speaking, we're on the same journey with Adam and Eve. Central to the instruction we receive throughout the endowment is that God is preparing us not just to return to his presence, but to return as heirs of his glory. In scriptural and prophetic language as kings and priests, queens and priestesses to God. In my opinion, one of the most important things you can do to prepare for the temple is to read Moses chapter 2 verse 1 all the way through Moses chapter 5 verse 11. The video for the temple endowment is largely based on these chapters, and I think if you've read them a couple of times, you'll have a good sense for what's happening and feel more comfortable as you receive the endowment ordinance. Throughout the endowment, there will be some pauses in the narration and the video where different things will happen. For example, at one point, everyone will put on ceremonial temple clothing. We talked earlier about how you had a packet of clothes that you didn't put on in the changing room. Well, during the endowment, you'll put on this sacred symbolic temple clothing over the white clothing you're already wearing. This temple clothing can, among other things, represent your future promises to become part of a royal lineage of priests and priestesses to God. You may have seen these sacred robes of the holy priesthood if you've ever seen an endowed family member at their viewing prior to being buried. You can also watch an excellent church video called Sacred Temple Clothing to see these robes and understand more about them. Dressing in ceremonial clothing is something that we don't do in sacrament meetings, so it might feel a little different. But remember, the temple is full of symbols. I'm not saying this is the only potential symbol for the ceremonial temple clothing that we wear, but consider it as one possibility. 
Imagine you were going into the presence of a queen or a king. You would want to be clean and prepared. You'd want to put on special clothing. This symbolism suggests that the endowment is preparing us to enter the presence of God. So it's not surprising we're putting on special clothing, especially clothing that, in ancient times, was connected with the temple and with holiness. Putting on these ceremonial clothes is a symbolic way of preparing to enter the presence of God. Another key part of our preparing to enter God's presence is that during the temple endowment, we covenant to live five specific laws. These laws help us to pattern our life after Jesus Christ. To the degree that we learn to live these celestial laws, we will become endowed with heavenly power. Because the endowment is being presented in a pre-recorded narration, there's no opportunity for you to put things on pause or to ask questions, so I think it's really important to know in advance what these covenants are. Let's talk about them individually and know that each one of them is explained in the church's handbook. First, we covenant to live the law of obedience and strive to keep Heavenly Father's commandments. Second, we covenant to obey the law of sacrifice, which means sacrificing to support the Lord's work and repenting with a broken heart and a contrite spirit. The law of sacrifice reminds us of Jesus Christ who gave the ultimate sacrifice. As it states in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 12, Jesus offered one sacrifice for sins forever and sat down on the right hand of God. Third, we covenant to obey the law of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the higher law that he taught while he was on the earth. Fourth, we covenant to keep the law of chastity, which means having no sexual activity except with those to whom we are legally and lawfully wedded according to God's law. Fifth, we covenant to keep the law of consecration, which means dedicating our time, talents, and everything with which the Lord has blessed us to building up Jesus Christ's church on the earth. So those are the five major laws and covenants in the endowment ceremony. If you want additional information about these covenants or to study them further, go to the church's temple website or ask an endowed family member or local church leader. So thus far, as part of receiving your endowment, we've talked about a video presentation of the plan of salvation, putting on ceremonial clothing, and making covenants. In addition, as stated earlier, Brigham Young taught that you will receive key words, signs, and tokens pertaining to the holy priesthood. By the time you get to the law of consecration, you'll know that the temple endowment is coming to the end. There's just two more things that I want to include in our discussion. First is a special prayer. You may have heard of putting a name on the prayer roll at the temple. This is where you can submit the name of family members or friends who are facing intense challenges to be prayed for at the temple. Well, prior to beginning an endowment session, a temple worker will gather all the names that have been submitted and place them in a small pouch. This pouch is placed on the altar at the front of the endowment room, and towards the end of the endowment session, those who want to participate gather around the altar and an ordinance worker offers a special prayer for those people whose names are in the pouch and others in need of heavenly blessings. This is a beautiful part of the endowment. Then, at the end of the endowment ceremony, you'll pass through the veil of the temple as you enter the celestial room, symbolic of coming into God's presence. Again, remember the importance of symbolism. At Christ's crucifixion, the veil of the temple was torn in two. In the New Testament, we are taught that the torn veil means that all of humanity can now enter into God's presence through the blood of Jesus by a new and living way through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. In other words, the temple veil represents Christ's sacrifice body. The parallels between the temple veil and the temple garment, with its several simple marks, help us see the garment as a powerful symbol of the Savior's body, sacrificed for us. As Terrell and Fiona Givens write, in our temples, as in the Jewish temple, the veil represents the portal into the divine presence. The temple veil, the emblem of Christ's own flesh, was torn at the crucifixion, suggesting that only through the broken body of the atoning Savior was access into God's presence possible for all. Prior to entering the celestial room, everyone is asked some simple questions about what was presented in the endowment. You don't need to worry about having all the answers. An ordinance worker will be there to help you. In fact, each time you go to the temple, there will always be a temple worker by your side to help you give the right answers. No need to stress. As you go through the veil, you enter the celestial room, which represents the celestial kingdom, or life with our heavenly parents. 
Here you can pray or ponder about important matters in your life. You can talk with other people in a quiet or reverent voice, sort of like you would in a temple baptistry chapel. It's up to you how long you spend in the celestial room. It's a beautiful place, a place to ponder and receive revelation. This is where the presentation of the temple endowment ends. However, don't forget that your quest to become endowed with heavenly power through living your covenants with God never ends. It's a lifelong pursuit, line upon line, throughout our entire lives and into the next, until we receive a fullness of the blessings, promises, and power of the endowment. After you leave the celestial room, you'll go back to your private changing area, change back into the clothes that you walked into the temple wearing, and then you'll leave the temple. And that's a brief overview of receiving your temple endowment. Once you've received your endowment, you are eligible to participate in the ordinances of sealing husbands and wives and children to their parents. These ordinances are performed in sealing rooms in the temple. Like the endowment, the sealing ordinances can be received both for yourself and in behalf of others, but that's probably a discussion for a different day. I hope this explanation has been helpful for you as you prepare to receive your own endowment. The temple may feel a little bit different or mysterious at first, and maybe it's supposed to. The temple and its ceremony should transport us into higher and holier realms. It's not supposed to feel common or like everyday life. And it's not all to be comprehended in your first visit or even on your hundredth visit. Before I conclude, just a couple of final thoughts. First, something practical to consider. On the day you receive your endowment, the temple will want you to arrive early and there'll probably be some wait time between the different things you do. By the time you change into your clothes, receive the initiatory ordinances, talk with temple leaders, and receive your endowment, you'll probably be in the temple for three or more hours. I mention this because if you're hungry when you walk into the temple, you might not be able to fully focus on the endowment. Some people want to fast before they receive their endowment, and I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. But it's possible hunger could distract you. In any event, if you're not consciously fasting, consider eating some food before you go to the temple. If I could give one final piece of advice, it's to stay focused on the big picture. Some people stress themselves out by trying to remember everything. Just forget about that. Focus on trying to feel the spirit, feel the binding strength of your covenants. Don't let any of the minutiae get in the way. Notice how Jesus Christ is the central figure in the temple endowment. His atoning sacrifice is the ultimate gift to each of us, and receiving your temple endowment will help you connect with him and our Heavenly Father. For more resources on preparing to receive your endowment, see the links in the description.